Welcome internet. Hope you're enjoying the DockerCon 2020 experience for those of you that are watching live today. The talk today we're going to be talking about is how to use mirroring and caching to optimize your image registry. So we're going to go through both the um, why you would want to do this and what it would take to implement. I'm Brandon Mitchell. I'm a Docker captain. During the day I help clients that are transitioning to containers as a consultant. And I also spent a good chunk of my free time working on answering questions on Stack Overflow. And that was how I got picked up by the captain's program a couple years back now. So it's been a fun journey to experience this with a lot of other very smart people in that group. So highly recommend it if you want to get yourself active in the community and spread the Docker knowledge. If you're interested in joining that program, highly recommend it. One thing I want to point out on my title slide here is the GitHub repo. These slides, along with all the demos and presenter notes, everything that I'm talking about today, have been checked into a, one of my repos over on GitHub. So after this, at the last slide, I'll have a link as well. You can go check that out for this content if you want to look at it later on or go into more detail. So let's dig into this. Perhaps you know this applies to you. You've got a build server that's ephemeral. It's building with something like a GitLab runner or a Jenkins agent, something like that, that gets cleaned up periodically, perhaps even after every build. Or maybe you have an office or a data center or a home lab that has multiple Docker engines out there running, multiple nodes that are running, pulling most likely the same images over the same network connection to all those hosts if you have something replicated across a lot of machines. Or perhaps you've been building images for long enough to have experienced the frustration of having someone upstream change their image in a way that broke your usage of that image. If you've used latest for long enough, or even if you've used any tag that's generic enough that gets modified upstream, that can break your downstream projects that you're working on, some of your uses of it. And unless you're depending on the SHA-256 checksum, even depending on uh, a specific tag, it can always get overwritten upstream. So it's a challenge that I think a lot of us have run into at some point. Or perhaps you've got an infrastructure you want to have tolerant of upstream outages, something that happens outside of your network. And it happens all the time. If you've seen the news way back, it used to be a bunch of ships that were cutting lines in the Mediterranean with their anchors. More recently, we've seen a lot of these BGP route issues where suddenly all the traffic to some major CDN or something like that gets rerouted to a business that's out in Pennsylvania. Or when Amazon's S3 went down, suddenly we all realized how dependent, how much the internet was on just that one service. So for production resilience, we've got this nailed out, nailed down with multiple replicas of our service behind a load balancer, and that load balancer probably has like a virtual IP. And that's how we handle our resilience from services hitting us. And we can scale this out horizontally. This is why containers are awesome. We're probably doing this if you're in Docker right now. But the build infrastructure has this inverted. We're taking one builder and we're talking to something external to us, and more than likely multiple resources external to us. And one of the big ones is talking out to a site like Docker Hub. And it doesn't matter where that connection could break. It could be our, our connection to the internet. It could be something on the internet trying to talk to Docker. It could be something from Docker Hub behind it. Maybe it's depending on S3. If it goes down, our bill goes down. And we can't fix that by having multiple replicas on our side. You know, We're dependent on that external service. So the solution that we typically have is to make our own local repo of some kind. And then we no longer, we, we break that dependency on that external resource if we can mirror this internally, if we can replicate this internally. The, the great thing about that is that we're going to get faster builds and we're going to use less bandwidth. So that's going to save us time and money. And that's, you know, that's a huge win-win. You usually don't get both of those at the same time. So to dig into this, I'm going to start with caching. We're going to break this into two parts. First part we're going to dig into is caching, and that's because caching is the easy button. Caching is the one thing I can go through a bunch of demos and show you exactly how to do this today in your environment with very little effort on your part. It's easy to maintain, it's unlikely to break, and if it does break, the Docker engine is going to fall back to a clean state where you're not going to have an outage on your part. You, know, you might not even notice when it does break, so that's a, that's a good design if I've ever run into it. The architecture we tend to see is that you have your Docker engine, 
talking to the cache, and that cache then talks to Docker Hub. And it only talks to Docker Hub if it doesn't have that image already in its local storage. And so you're going to say, grab this image for me. It's going to say, do I have the layers of this image locally? Yes, return that to the Docker engine. The one important detail to note is that that cache is always going to check for the upstream manifest. It's going to say what layers are associated with this tag for this image. And do I have those layers locally? And yes, pull them from local. If not, let's start updating our local repo. That's going to help you if you have a potentially stale image, but it's also going to be a downside later on that we'll get into. The implementation of this is two parts. First part is the Docker daemon itself needs to be told that it has a cache to work with. And the flag we're looking for is dash dash registry mirror. And you can either specify that on the Docker D command line, or you can pass it in the daemon.json file. And I, I'm a big fan of the daemon.json, but depending on how you're doing this, the first option may be easier, and we'll even use that in the demonstrations here today. The second part is you actually need to set up that cache. And so for that, you can use the registry image that Docker provides and you have to pass a flag to it, this proxy remote URL flag. And when you do that, that tells that registry image that it's not a normal registry. It is acting as this pull through cache that whenever something requests to it, it needs to pass that request upstream and then pull those layers back and then cache those layers. So let's start demonstrating some of this. I'm going to start with a file that's got a whole bunch of commands I'm going to run from, and this is also on the GitHub repo. The first command up there is to create a network. And I'm going to spin up a couple images or a couple containers on that network. The first one is our registry, and the second one is a Docker and Docker instance that I'm using as my builder. This is, think of it as your ephemeral build node. The flag I'm passing is that registry mirror flag, so it tells it to use that local registry that we just spun up. And I'm going to do this with a little split screen. I'm going to show you the actual log file from the registry image so we can see the hits going to that registry. And I'm going to exec into that builder image, and I'm just going to run a pull from in there. And what we'll see is that the pull was successful. We got that down. But if we look through the logs, you're going to see that that pull wasn't su su successful from our pull through cache. We got a 404 error there. So when we were mentioning earlier that you might not even notice there's an outage, sometimes you have to go dig and look to see if there was something going wrong there. You can look near the Docker logs on the Docker and Docker instance, or you can look at this registry log to see what's going wrong. But it also gives you the idea that this is very resilient. If something goes wrong with the mirror, Docker's still going to work. It's still going to go successful. The thing we messed up in that mirror is we didn't pass that argument that we were talking about. We needed to pass that arg that specifies the proxy remote URL. So I'm going to specify that. I'm also going to specify the local storage file system and to do this, we need to delete and recreate that image with those options. The storage is a volume, so now the next time I run this, it's going to be persistent. So if I delete and recreate this proxy, which I do a fair number of times in this, I'm going to get those same volumes. So got the logs back up. I'm doing the pull again. And there you can see that pull was went successfully through there. So there's some logs that output in there that you can see from a 200 return code and above there was response completed. So this was a good pull through. This actually uh, did its job the way we were expecting it to. But what you're probably wondering is, well, that's fine and dandy for BusyBox, but uh, we let's let's see something bigger. Let's see something like Ubuntu. And this is where we're going to see some of the value of it. This is over my home network during the corona time. So we've got how many of my neighbors sharing the same ISP connection, watching their Netflix. But this will give you a rough idea of a general speed up from this. Pulling this image down, and it took us about 16 seconds to pull that down. I'm going to completely delete that builder. So think of it like your ephemeral builder. It could also be a second node in the data center, however you want to think about your scenario as it applies to you but I'm going to completely wipe out the old one. I'm also deleting the volume where I had the var lib docker so I don't have anything from before, nothing up my sleeves, no cheating here. And I'm going to do that pull a second time. And this time you saw it took us under two seconds. So that was a massive speed up for us. And the time here is the time for us to talk from our local Docker instance to that pull through cache. The pull through cache just checks a small JSON bit of manifest up on Docker Hub that says, did this change yet or not? If it didn't change, it just gives you all the local uh, layers that it downloaded last time. So we just sped that up dramatically. 
that should give you a feel for when you set this up, you want to make sure this is as close as possible to the nodes that are using it. You don't want it as close as possible to where you're building your images. You want it as close as possible to where you are pulling from this cache. So if you're pulling from a data center, you want it close to those nodes, not from where you're generating the thing. Okay, so that works in a private repo. What about, or so that worked in a public repo, let's look at the private repo side. So in this case, I've put my password and credentials and tokens and everything in a .env file. And pro tip one, don't commit your credentials into a uh, repo that you're checking into GitHub, so that's not checked in with this demo. And the other thing is to use a uh, two-factor authentication and a, um, a token the Docker will give you that only lets these used for pulling and pushing and not for anything else. So that's, you know, the token credentials are up there on Docker Hub now, it's a great new feature. So I just recreated that with that token, or I did a login with that token and I just did a uh, push into my repo. So now I've got something up there and I did a pull. The pull looks like it succeeded, but I haven't changed anything on that pull through cache. And if I look at the logs here, I'm gonna see that it looks like, no, that completed with an error. That did not work. And the reason it didn't work is that we pulled from our local machine, we logged in on the local Docker engine, but we haven't logged in on that pull through cache and the pull through cache doesn't know about our credentials in our local Docker engine. So we need to put those credentials in the pull through cache explicitly. And so if I scroll down here, you see I've got a couple new arguments that got included. Proxy username, proxy password, when I put those in that pull through cache in that registry instance there, now that registry instance has the ability to pull images from our private repo. So be aware anything that can touch this pull through cache now has access to pull our private images from our registry. So there is a pro and a con to this, but let's see if this actually works. So I went through, I recreated that registry image. I'm now pulling from there. It says it worked, and if I look at the logs this time, it says response completed. So that's that's looking pretty pretty positive there. One thing to be aware of though is that when we're running this stuff, they're going so quick. Um, a lot of the stuff is actually has the layers cached locally. So let me do a scenario where I'm actually pulling some of those bytes through that pull through cache for a change. So I'm gonna, let's see, did I, no, I didn't wanna exit there because that would have messed up my demo. Gotta make sure when you're in or not, when we're not inside of an image. So I have now recreated that builder instance, and now I'm gonna rerun this exec to pull the Ubuntu image. And this is the Ubuntu from my private repo. And that's looking kind of slow again. If you see the stuff on the bottom of the screen, you can see some logs cruising through, it's getting 200, things look happy there. But that was a slow pull. And that's because this is the first time those layers came through that pull through cache for this private repo. So I'm gonna go ahead and do this one more time. I'm gonna reset that whole image, I'm gonna clean out the volume, go back to a clean container, and go back to a good clean state. And there it goes nice and quick from the pull through cache like we were expecting. So we've got this working now up in just, you know, about 10 minutes here where we've set up our own pull through cache for our private repo that we can use for any of our local instance. Let me uh, dig through one more scenario here before we get back into some of the more slidey things. And I wanna talk about what if we did a pull directly from a cache? What if we were to try to say, pull this thing from hub-cache right, right to our repo like that? If I'm gonna run that, what's gonna happen here is I'm gonna get an error. And the error is Docker saying, I'm trying to get HTTP, or I'm getting an HTTP response when I'm trying to do HTTPS. We haven't set up any certificates on this instance. So let me do this. I've got a little script here where I've got a bunch of open SSL commands. I'm gonna, show you what I'm doing, nothing too outrageous here. The one detail that I'll be changing throughout this is that host name in there says hub-cache. I'm gonna be adding more host names later on. But I've now created that certificate. I need to clean up both of my containers because I need to tell the registry instance that it has a certificate to use. And I need to tell my builder instance that it needs to trust that certificate because by default it would never trust this certificate if it saw it on the internet because this is some person claiming he's whoever he wants to claim he is. That's what a self-signed certificate does. So updated or cleaned everything up there. I updated the registry. So now the registry has that. And when I run this, I got an error on that Docker container run command for the second one. What's happening there, um, I'm gonna give you another command I'm running that has this dash dash mount syntax. And I have to do that dash dash mount syntax because the path that I'm mounting in there, etsy docker search.d where you tell Docker what certificates to trust, 
there's a colon in that path. And when you do the dash v syntax, that colon is the same separator between the elements in the dash v syntax. And so you can't have that extra colon there. It throws an extra separator and the parse fails for that. So the mount syntax is comma delimited. And if you ever run into a crazy scenario where that gives you trouble because you have a comma in your path, you can actually put quotes around your string inside of there, some escape quotes, and it'll work too. So that's a little extra pro tip I'll throw at you. So, okay, I got this thing up. Let me make sure I didn't break anything with that. So let me just do a quick uh, pull from my private repo there. Yeah, that looked like it worked. Now let me go through and call it from the name, that hub dash cache name. See if I can pull that. That was our first thing we were trying to do right. That didn't work. Let me try something else. Let me try to pull our private repo through that hub dash cache name. And that does work. So now why didn't the other one work? Well, if you ever look at the Docker official images, the actual repo name under the covers there is slash library. So it's slash library slash Ubuntu, not just slash Ubuntu. Docker's doing some nice little fancy convenience stuff when it sees you give it a short name and it just expands that out that says, well, it must be Docker Hub and it must be a slash library because it's an official image when you don't have anything else in the path. So, okay, we got this. We, we now have a couple cool tips here. We're understanding what's going on with the, uh, with the pull through cache a little bit. So what's the catch? That's the thing a lot of people might be wondering because I told you this is a two-part talk. So if there's a second part, there must be something that's not great about this. And there are a few catches. One is that that uh, registry mirror flag, that only applies to Docker Hub. So if you're using any of the other registry services out there, if you're talking to a, a GitLab or a, pick any of your own registries, any of the cloud registries out there, this is not going to work for that because you can't pass that in that flag to the Docker engine. But I'll show you a, a workaround for that in another second or two. And the it can only cache pulls, not pushes. So that one is talking about if you have a new image you've created locally and you saw me push it up to my private repo, it didn't get cached at that point. It had to, I had to pull it a second time or I had to pull it to get it to cache at all. And that was because those layers had to get pulled through the cache for it to cache them. Your push doesn't even touch the pull through cache means we're sending this traffic over the network twice to get it saved once, and that's, that's not ideal. All right, third downside, we're still querying the Docker Hub to see if that upstream image changed since the last pull. So an unexpected upstream change can break your builds and, or your deploys, and an outage can also break us too, because we're still checking, did that tag change, yes or no? And if we try to query it and we can't get that query to go through the pull through cache, that registry instance there, it's going to say I got an error back and you'll have problems trying to run those. So that's that's a potential outage that we were trying to solve and we didn't really solve with this. And credentials for that private repo, putting those in that registry, I think a lot of people are hesitating on that one, myself included. Let's, we should try to find a little better solution for that. And the pull through cache itself, this last bullet point might confuse some people. There are multiple ways you can authenticate to a Docker registry. And the one Docker Hub supports is called bearer tokens. There are some other registry services out there that might use basic auth instead of bearer tokens. And if you run into some of those, they will not work with this, uh, with this pull through cache Docker has. I'm working through a PR right now. I'll see if I can get that out, maybe even before this video airs. And, you know, we'll see how long it takes for that to get uh, committed and approved upstream because right now it looks like I'm deleting a bunch of code. And whenever you delete too much code, you worry you might have broken something that someone wants. So we'll see how that goes. But, um, you know, if you're interested in this, feel free to ping me on Twitter and I'll make sure to get that out to GitHub for you to try. The one site I've run into that had this issue though was GitHub. And so unless you're using that one, you might be okay because a lot of them use bearer tokens. It tends to be the popular option. All right, so that first bullet point there where I told you that this only works for Docker Hub, I also said I was going to give you a couple options. You might be thinking of one of those options from a couple slides back in that demo back, but we can configure something completely outside of Docker. We can set up a squid proxy completely outside of Docker. It just looks at all the HTTP traffic and goes to and proxies it for us. So that's an option. It's not a Docker option, so I'm not going to talk about it much more than here. Just want to make sure you know it's a possibility. We could pull directly from the cache, like you saw in that demo a couple back there. So I'll show you that one again, just talking to a private repo or to a, to a GitLab repo. And we could also do some fanciness with some DNS and TLS certificates. I'm not going to get into it here just for because of time-wise, but if you're interested in that, go into my GitHub repo where I give you a link to my presentation later on, 
and look at the extended version of this and you'll see a demo where I walked through what, what it takes to do some low DNS TLS trickery within Docker so that one container thinks it's talking to that external registry. Okay, so here's a demo where I want to show us that we can just change the name and we can talk to something like a GitLab instead of somewhere else. So I'm going to run through this demo where I pull directly from the cache. And the first thing I need to make sure that I'm doing is that I'm not inside of a container and I'm not, okay. And so let's go through, I'm showing you right there, I added an extra DNS entry in there for that GitLab cache. One thing I didn't show you before is that I'm also going to switch this over to a Docker Compose. So you'll see that as well, I think. Did I? Yes, I did. So switch this over to Docker Compose. There's another demo out there that I had to cut as well, just for time. So this Compose, what I've added to this from the previous uh, inst version of this was that I add the GitLab cache because I'm now caching from GitLab. And in the Builder instance, which is the same stuff we had before, I'm just putting in a nice Compose file that I can easily modify and update. I now added an extra entry in there for the Etsy Docker Search D for my GitLab cache instance. And now the GitLab contains the registry gitlab.com and my credentials, everything that I need for that. Credentials for all this stuff is in a .env file, not checked into the repo. They wouldn't even be valid if you tried them anyway. So let me spin this up. And this is going to start up. And when it comes up, the first thing I want to do is I want to exec into this builder. And this will be a fairly quick demo because I don't go into too much detail here. I'm going to, well, maybe not as quick as I wanted to because I'm seeing the image I'm getting ready to pull. I'm going to do a login. And I'm going to do everything talking straight to the registry. So I'm not doing anything with that pull through cache yet. I'm now pulling down the Docker image or Debian image here. This is the first time I pull this one through. There is a pull through cache for the Docker hub. And so this is the first time that that instance has seen this Debian image. So this takes a second. And then I'm going to retag that and push that to GitLab. Fortunately, my GitHub re GitLab repo has seen this before. So this part is nice and quick. So I'm going to tag it, push it, and we're up. So now let's see if we can pull it through that GitLab cache instance. And so remember what I'm doing here is I'm changing that registry name, changing that first part of the image name that says use my cache instead of talking to the remote thing. And there you see, we went through and we pulled it nice and quickly through there. Of course, all these layers were pre-cached, but you could go through this demo longer on your own and see that it is actually going through that cache with all the layers. The important thing to note here is we had to change that registry name. And so if you need to use this in your own infrastructure, in your own environment, you now have to change the from lines in your Docker files. You now need to change in the Docker run commander in your compose file that registry name in front of your image. So there's a little bit of extra work, but there is a nice value to it that you're going to save a lot of bandwidth. So it might be worth that effort. But you might be looking at this and saying, I want a little bit more because you don't want the credentials being cached. You don't want some upstream changes where something breaks outside of us to break your environment, or maybe someone just changes whatever the version three is and you thought the version three was gonna be, you know, Simver compatible and never breaking on you and they did break it. So what you need is something a little bit more in your control. And for that, we look at mirroring. And mirroring is pretty much the same design we had before. I just changed a couple numbers on this picture here. What we did is we changed the order and instead of it being a pull through cache in that middle, it's a now a mirror and the mirror, really, it's just a registry. It's nothing else than it's a registry with different settings. And the setting is just be a registry. What makes it a mirror is we're going to actually pull, retag, and push images to that mirror. And that's going to be the first step we do. Before you do it, any of those other Docker engines trying to query that mirror are going to get uh, image not found. Can't pull that down. It's not doesn't exist. So you now have to manually populate that. But Let's dig into this a little bit farther. The mirror itself, I mentioned, is just a registry. So you could use the registry image that Docker has out there. If you're going to do this on your own, you're going to do it for more than a small little uh, sandbox environment. I highly recommend Harbor. It's a CNCF project that uh, takes everything you want with a registry. Things like user management, vulnerability scanning, all that good stuff. They've got an, they've got an awesome project out there. Highly recommend it. The API for the registry is open. So if you want to use this from some other vendor. You might have an artifact repo out there for something like a Nexus or an Artifactory. Those all have versions of this as well. So you've got uh, all kinds of options to do this. So what it's going to take for us to do this is a uh, manual mirroring. You just do a Docker image pull, a retag with your local mirror, and a Docker image push. And now you've mirrored it. That's all it takes. I typically do a lot more than this. I typically have a, a little bit more involved script. And the 
first two commands here, I'm going to pull from my local mirror and then I pull from the remote image out there. And the reason I do it in that order, that order is important, is I want to get those layers. If I'm pulling this to like an ephemeral node that hadn't seen these layers before, I want to pull those from the local fast mirror first that's over the local network and get those uh, layers into that Docker image from that mirror. And then when I pull that remote image, if they haven't changed, that pull is almost instantaneous. So that's how you speed up this script. Then I compare the remote and the local ID. If it was the same image, those IDs are going to match. And so if those IDs don't match, then I go into this process where I need to say I need to update my mirror with a new image. The first thing I do that uh, I'll say a lot of other people don't do when they're setting up a mirror is I back up my old image. I take my local image and I date stamp it or I put a build number in there if it's running from within CI. And I keep that as a local image name and I'm going to push that in a later step. And then I take the remote image and I overwrite the local image that I've got. I retag the remote image with the local image name. And then I push those two local images, the retagged remote image and that local image backup that I had. Push those up to my registry. Now my registry has a backup and an updated image. So that's great. You know, that, that's good. But why do we have all this complication? Because there is uh, now we've got a shell script that I'm running. There's, you know, more overhead. That, pull, that easy button from the pull through cache was pretty nice and easy. Why, why would I want to go through this? Especially because if you look at a project like Harbor, they've got a little functionality in there where they'll automatically sync a repo for you. Nothing else for you to do. It's a nice little GUI. You click through some boxes and you have it, uh, you have it mirroring those images for you. The reason I like this over something that's automatic out of some of these other projects, for one, um, I have a better control of when I want to run this. And so since it's a script that I'm running, I can run this within my CI pipeline. I can put it wherever I want to. So I have a little bit more control of when I run it. And the when is usually at the beginning of like a sprint, or maybe it is at the beginning of some CI pipeline where I know that I'm, I'm comfortable updating it at this point. The other huge point though, is that backup. That backup that I ran now gives me a backout option where the other versions out there they don't give you a backout option. They just say, I'm going to update this with whatever the remote one is. We're just keeping these two in sync. We're making it a mirror. It's a true mirror in that case. In my case, I'm actually adding a little bit of extra overhead where I'm keeping these backups, but the backups give me a back out. And so if something ever goes wrong, I now have a way to get out from that change. Compared to a pull through cache, we have those two reasons, but we also now have these images that we have built locally, something that we built for our own infrastructure, we can push into the same registry. We now have dual use of this registry. We can use it as a mirror and as our local registry for our local deployments. And the biggest chain, the biggest improvement of all is that we're no longer dependent on those external resources. If something breaks, if something gets modified outside of our control, we don't break internally because of that. We now have our local registry. We are now fully disconnected from what goes on outside. It's only the mirroring step when we say update the mirror that we're dependent on it. And if that step breaks, we still have our existing mirror to keep running with the old version. So that's, that's a huge pro. There are a lot of disadvantages though. One is that if someone's not running that script, it's going to get outdated images. And trust me, the developers and the security team will both equally dislike you if you're running a mirror with six month old images. You know, they want stuff that doesn't have security vulnerabilities. They want stuff that has the current functionality. And if you don't give it to them, they're going to understandably not be happy. The other thing is that to add a new image, I really want to make this as easy as possible for the developers. And so I tend to make this part of a CI job, something that they can commit a pull request to, to add new images to it, it needs to be something that they can easily update. And by making it easy for them to update, they're not going to work around the people setting up this infrastructure for them. They're not going to make their images go out direct to Docker Hub when we made them this nice image mirror environment. You know, if your images that you're trying to access aren't in the mirror and you start going to Docker Hub, that defeats the whole purpose. So make it easy for them to play within the play within the rules there. The next, you know, the, the next issue here is the recovery is a lot more involved. With a pull through cache, a recovery is just stop it, clean the volume up, restart it, and it'll just start repopulating as people pull images. With a mirror, you now come back up clean. You now need to run that mirror script again to pull all those images local before anybody can do anything with it. So there's a, there's a lot more involved with that one, a lot more manual intervention involved there. When you're doing this, I mentioned earlier, you're going to need to change your registry. Make that a variable. Make that something you can easily tweak. In a Docker file itself, you can specify a build arg, and the variable I initialize it to 
is something like your upstream Docker Hub. In case you don't know, that's just docker.io. Put that in there and it's going to make the request to Docker Hub. So I put that in there as a registry name. And then from that point forward, all these requests go there. It makes it a lot easier when you want to change it later on that your local build environment just passes that build arg for your local builds. And you don't affect anybody else that are trying to use your images outside of your environment that don't have access to your mirror. Same kind of variable technique goes when you're doing a Docker Compose file or even on the command line. All right, so to summarize here, both of these are going to save us bandwidth. Both of these are going to give us faster builds. So either way, you're going to get a win-win with this. If you want the easy option, go with a pull-through cache. Doesn't have a lot of maintenance. It's great. If you want something that's a little bit more involved, um, but gives you some of that ability to tolerate upstream outages and to control changes, go with that managed mirror. It's going to be a huge improvement for you. All right, as promised, the link to this repo up here is that GitHub link. That QR code will also take you there. So feel free to check that out. And thank you. You've been a great audience. Didn't hear anybody so much as cough, so it's been fantastic. I hope you enjoyed, enjoyed this presentation. Stay safe, stay healthy, and thank you.